Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, I've been having a great time here in Cambridge for the last six months or so. So I guess uh, in the same way that little kids are sometimes asked to write an essay about what they did on their summer vacation, this is a talk on what I've been doing on my sabbatical. Um, and this is joint work with Sanjeev Goyal. Uh, it's work in progress. You'll see that there's still a couple of pieces that we're, we're trying to, to add to the puzzle here. Um, but it seemed like it was far enough along to, to give a talk on it and hopefully the presence of these two probably familiar to many of you icons, is certainly the one on the left, um, will, will become clear in a slide or so. Um, so um, among other settings in this work were motivated by settings where the following conjunction of conditions broadly occur. So imagine that you have two or more companies with competing products or services, and for the purposes of this talk, I want to think of those competing products or services as largely interchangeable in terms of their basic functionality, i.e. not severe differences in, in, in quality or other properties. Um, but these are products or services in which consumers generally only want or need to select one of them. Um, we're going to assume that the adoption behavior of these products uh, among the consumers is determined or at least very, very strongly influenced by their underlying social network. So they're going to hear about products from their friends, see what their friends are using, and then make adoption decisions based on sort of their local neighborhood of adoption. And we're going to imagine that we're in a, something like a, what you might call a viral marketing setting in that the companies can seed adoption via, let's say, things like promotions, marketing budgets, giveaways, so on and so forth. So you can imagine these companies, and we will formalize this uh, in this way, as two players in the game that kind of know this underlying social network and can decide where to place their budget in terms of seeding initial adoption. Okay? And we're going to look at a model eventually where the underlying product or service is largely characterized by two properties. One is what I might call infectiousness, which is how quickly or slowly adoption occurs in the population, regardless of which product is being adopted. So here I'm sort of asking the question, um, how contagious are social networks, ignoring the differentiation between the different types of social networks? And then the second property is what I'm going to consider the platformness, which is what are the strength of platform effects? What it, to what extent do you desire or need to adopt the same choice of product or service as those in your social network? Okay, so that's, that's the broad background. And to just give some motivating examples from technology, and I say that these examples are subjective in that I don't necessarily tend that you, intend that you agree with me on my characterization of each of these different uh, products or services, but just agree with me that there is variation um, across different products and services in terms of these two parameters, infectiousness and platform effects. So, you know, if I had to give my own subjective opinion on these different examples in online social networking services, you have a certain slowness of infectiousness because by definition these services are only useful after a certain number of people or more specifically your own friends have adopted the service. There's not a lot of joy in being the first user of Facebook. Um, uh, but it has rather strong platform effects, at least at this moment in, its, in their evolution. We don't really have good mechanisms for cross-platform exchange, right? So you're kind of largely locked into one of these social networks if you invest a lot of time in it. And there's a great desire, of course, to join that social network that most of your friends are on. Um, if, in contrast, you look at things like desktop computers and operating systems, I would argue that at least at their um, at their initial introduction, these were rather infectious in that they were useful for doing some things immediately, regardless of whether other people were using them. You still had word processors on them and spreadsheets and the like. Um, and there's some, I would say there are more moderate platform effects here. There's still some exchange barriers, let's say, between Macs and Windows uh, machines, but they're largely eradicated by now. Tablet computers are somewhere in between in their infectiousness. You definitely need there to be sort of development of apps before these things start to become useful. And there are, I would say, stronger platform effects than in desktop computers because you need the app marketplace to, once the app marketplace has evolved for a particular platform, it makes it much more attractive 
than one for which there are very few apps available. And so on and so forth. You know, cell phone service, it's very infectious because even the first cell phone user was able to make outbound calls to landlines and be called from those lines, so on and so forth. The platform effects are relatively moderate. Companies try to make their B platform effects with things like friends and family programs, so on and so forth. And then things like television sets are strongly infectious in that you can immediately get content once you have one. And the platform effects here, I think, are extremely weak, right? Because it doesn't matter what other people own as a television set in terms of the functionality of your own television set. And I would argue uh, that the proof of this is how many of you really know what television brands your friends own. OK. So let me try to take these stories and, and motivations and turn them into a model. So this is what I'll call a competitive contagion model. So we imagine that, again, there are two competing companies offering similar underlying products. Let's call them red and blue. Uh, the, there's an underlying known social network, or graph G, of consumers. Uh, the two players respectively have um, some number of initial infections they concede in the network. I'm going to call those. Uh, the budget of red K sub R and B K sub B. And I'm going to allow for the possibility that these budgets are unequal and will in fact study that phenomenon. And so without loss of generality, let's say that, that the red player has at least as much budget as the blue player. And so then R and B are going to play a one-shot two-player game. So they're simultaneously going to choose where to seed their initial infections in the network. And then there will be local stochastic infection dynamics over this graph that then determine um, whether and how many subsequent infections each of the two players would get. And their payoffs are simply going to be the total number of infections they eventually realize in the stochastic dynamic process taking place on the underlying network. OK. So the, let's talk about what those dynamics are. So um, we're going to assume that the infection dynamics over the graph are determined by two functions. F and G, which are applied locally at each update in this stochastic dynamics. So let's let V be some vertex in G that we're going to consider updating in response to its local neighborhood. Um, and there are going to be two numbers which are important in this update, which are fractions, uh, let's call them XR and XB, of their infected neighbors. So these are local quantities. They're, they're specific to the particular vertex V at any given moment in time. XR is the fraction of uh, V's neighbors that are currently adopting red. XB is the fraction of their neighbors that are currently adopting blue. And so XR plus XB is the total fraction of neighbors that have adopted one or the other of the two products or services. Okay? So uh, the two functions which determine or characterize the dynamics are going to be what I call the contagion function. Yes? Um, you mean in the updates, or are you talking about at the local updates, or you're talking about the level of the players? The whole goal for the players, of course, is to see their initial adoptions to maximize the eventual number of infections. But individuals have no rationality in this model. Individuals simply blindly adopt in a stochastic way determined by these two functions. Okay? So the only rationality in this game is at the level of the two companies. Okay? People basically follow the decisions in their friend, of their friends in a way that I'm describing now. So the contagion function takes the fraction of your neighbors that are adopting one or the other of the products and maps it to a probability that you're going to adopt one or the other of the products. So F here is agnostic to the fractions of your neighbors, which are relatively red or blue, and just says, how likely are you to adopt some social networking service based on the fraction of your neighbors that are adopting some social networking service? Okay. Um, so that's what I'm going to call the contagion function. It, it models how infectious the underlying service is, regardless of who's offering it. And then there's going to be a selection function, which gets applied after the contagion function. So in the selection function, the input to the selection function is, let's say, the relative fraction of infected neighbors that are infected with red, right? So it's the fraction of red infections divided by the fraction of total infections. Okay, so I'm normalizing here by the underlying um, total fraction of infections in the neighborhood. Okay? And g the value of G here is going to be the conditional probability that you adopt red or blue given that you're going to adopt anything at all. Okay? So just to be clear, the way the dynamics work is we pick some vertex to update, we compute XR and XB, we first essentially flip a coin based on the value of F. So the value of F tells us the probability that you're going to adopt 
uh, one or the other of the products at all. So we first flip that coin. If it's decided that you don't adopt, then the process ends and you stay, you're uninfected. If it's decided that you adopt, then we additionally compute the value of G to see whether you adopt red versus blue, given that you're infected. Okay? These dynamics clear? Okay, so <coughs> I'm eventually going to discuss more precise conditions on F and G, and where we're headed with this is an attempt to give kind of a broad characterization of what happens with certain standard quantities in this game as a function of the properties of F and G. But as some basic ground rules that we're going to assume on F and G, um, we're going to assume that F of 0 is 0 and F of 1 is 1. If nobody's using the service in your neighborhood, rem remember these are all applied at the local level. So this is simply saying if none of your friends have adopted any of these services, you're not going to. If all of them have, you're definitely going to. And that it's an increasing function in between. The general conditions on G are similar, right? If nobody in your neighborhood is playing red, you're not going to adopt red. If everybody in your neighborhood is playing red, among those that are infected, you're, you're going to adopt red. And we also have this fairness condition, which basically says that the behavior of adoption for red and blue is symmetric, okay? And I'll, I'll show pictures of what I mean by this shortly. Um, some of our results allow the possibility that these F and G could be personalized, right? So some of us could have higher rates of infectiousness than others. Some of us could have more or less, um, you know, have variations in our G functions as well. But this is the basic setup. And so by changing the graph and what the budgets of the players are in F and G, you obtain a pretty rich set of dynamical models, okay? Right, so the only to whom to see That's right. There's no price, yeah. These, just think of the, this is just a study of, of adoption dynamics, not of pricing. Okay? You'll see things are, things are kind of complex enough as, as it is. <clears throat> so just to make this a little concrete, here is a bunch of sample contagion functions sampled from the family in which the contagion function f of x is just x to some power r. And you can see that, of course, I can model many things already within this simple parametric family. First of all, I can just have sort of linear contagion, which is basically the probability that you adopt is proportional to the fraction of your neighbors that have currently adopted. But I can also have, um, by choosing r, uh, actually this should be reversed, for, by choosing r less than 1, I can get concave adoption. And these, this sort of models the case where you know, once a small fraction of your friends has adopted, it's extremely attractive for you to adopt as well, with then sort of diminishing returns later. And at the, in the other regime, which should be r greater than 1, sorry, you get convex uh, curves where you might have slower adoption. You can, in fact, even kind of approach threshold behavior, where once you get kind of a, you know, you have no probability of adoption for a long time, but once there's a critical fraction of your neighbors that have adopted, your, your probability of adoption rises very rapidly. Okay? And I'll return to this family uh, later in the talk. <coughs> oh, here's a, a, um, a parametric family for the selection functions. This is actually the um, well-known uh, Tulloch contest function for different choices of the exponent. So the particular algebraic form is up here, but is less important than I think that the picture is. Again, we could have linear behavior, which in this case means that if you're going to be infected, the probability that you adopt red is proportional to the fraction of your neighbors playing red. But you can also have what I would call equalizing or punishing effects. So in the punishing regime, I'm, I'm referring to the minority, the minority party kind of gets punished, right? So for these kinds of functions, if your product is adopted by sort of less than half of the neighborhood, you have a very, very low probability of being adopted. And once it crosses a half, then you have a very, very high probability. So these are sort of functions that to varying degrees as you go to larger and larger values of this parameter s, um, have more and more severe punishing effects on the minority. And at the other extreme, you could have equalizing functions, right? And these are functions where at the logical extreme, like the truly equalizing one is the one is g, of, g is identically equal to a half, right? So that uh, once you decide to adopt, you flip a coin to adopt red versus blue regardless of what your neighbors are doing. Um, and so you can kind of approximate that with steeper and steeper equalizing functions. And these are cases where even the party with the minority represent, the company with the minority representation in the neighborhood can still get a rather good chance of adoption. Okay? Okay, so um, let me give you some uh, illustrative simulations um, in which I'm going to 
show you varying combinations of linear concave or convex contagion functions, linear punishing or equalizing selection functions, um, some standard uh, models for graph structures, namely erdos renyan preferential attachment. Um, in all of these simulations, there will be a slight budget advantage for red. And importantly, and against the model that I'm going to discuss, the initial infections in these cases are chosen randomly um, in these simulations, um, part, in part for the reason that um, uh, computing best responses in these models is probably a difficult thing. Yes? Nice idea. We haven't even come close to doing that yet because we're still working out the math. But yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I completely agree. Um, okay, so let me show you some of these simulations. Uh, so here, for instance, um, just to show you what the choices of the functions are, here's a case where the contagion function has a rather concave shape. So adoption happens rapidly as you get a few neighbors infected and the selection function is linear, uh, meaning that you select proportionally given uh, between the two diff competing services in the case of adoption. And here's a movie uh, or quick simulation showing what happens in that case. Okay, so you can see and of course um, but by the way, all the simulations I'm going to show you are sort of on the same time scale. So differences in the speed of adoption correspond to what actually is occurring in the underlying model. So, you know, if we kind of, if I kind of go back and step through this simulation a step at a time, because, because there's sort of strong contagion effects, you see that things spread rather rapidly. And it looks like that, um, you know, roughly speaking, despite the fact that red started off with a slight advantage, that advantage has neither been increased nor decreased. I'm making, a, obviously, a qualitative statement here. Uh, the initial ratios were sort of 60% red, 40% blue, and we're not badly violating that here. Um, in contrast, if I uh, look at a convex, um, sorry, if I look at a convex adoption function and, again, linear selection function, then, you know, what you would expect is there to be slower or fewer adoptions, but still roughly in equal proportions of red and blue in the populations at the end. And indeed, this is what happens, right? So in, on the same time scale, we have many, many fewer adoptions, but a roughly uh, a split between red and blue that's roughly equal to what it was at the beginning. Um, if we look, for instance, at uh, um, a case where the adoption function is concave. Let's see, what which one do I want here? Well, let's look at this one. So here's one where the, the selection function is linear, so you have proportional adoption, but you have a punishing selection function. And lo and behold, right, you get pretty good rates of adoption um, because you, don't, you have a, at least a linear if, and, and not convex adoption function. But now you can see that the fraction of red adoption has been amplified by the dynamics simply because even though red started with this only slight advantage 6-4, when you apply this local dynamics, that advantage gets amplified on average because the, se the con selection function is favoring the majority party strongly in each neighborhood. Okay? Um, and so, I, you know, I've got other simulations of this kind that in the interest of time I won't show. Um, and similar phenomena happen in the case of, um, let's say, preferential attachment graphs. But there are definitely sort of network structure specific um, phenomena here. So one qualitative thing I would say from staring at many of these simulations is that even when you have a strongly punishing selection function, in preferential attachment, there's just a better chance for the party with the smaller budget to get lucky. Because in a preferential attachment network, there are these hub vertices where if you sort of manage to put your seed infections there, even though you only have four and the other player has six, if you get more high degree vertices when you're four than the other did six, you just stand a better chance of getting a larger share of the final outcome. So the sort of punishment effects seem stronger, let's say, in something like erdos Reni than they do in preferential attachment. Okay. So that's kind of a model and a little illustration of what it's like. Um, here are some interesting questions that one might want to ask about this model. So an obvious one is, how does network structure and the properties of the function f and g influence actual properties of the equilibrium? 
okay? It's sort of a, a, a structural level. Um, and I would say that we're quite interested in this question and it's on the agenda, but we don't know a lot here yet. And even reasoning about rather simple cases like cyclical structures you'll find can be, can be complicated. Um, on the other hand, um, about some broader aspects of equilibria, um, including the price of anarchy, we can actually say quite a bit. So, um, uh, so the two, the two for the rest of the talk, the two quantities I want to focus are are the price of anarchy. I'll define these for those of you that are not familiar with them in a second. Um, but it basically compares max social welfare versus equilibrium welfare. And a new quantity um, that we introduced called the price of budgets, which is essentially the extent to which the network structure and dynamics can amplify inequalities in the initial budgets, okay? Um, and so it turns out that for these two rather broad properties of equilibria, um, we actually know quite a bit. And so what I'm gonna describe to you eventually are results giving upper bounds for these two quantities that are independent of the underlying graph and depend only on certain broad properties of F and G on the one hand. And then in other cases, lower bounds on these two quantities, sort of showing that the price of anarchy or the price of budgets can be large for specific graphs, again, dependent on relatively broad properties of F and G. Okay, so let me just um, in quickly describe these two quantities. So, you know, a game in this class of models is specified by the network, the choices of the contagion and selection functions F and G, and the initial budgets for the two players. So let's fix such a game. So the price of anarchy for that particular game is defined to be the max social welfare versus the worst Nash equilibrium payoff. So the, by max social welfare, just to be clear here, I mean ignoring strategic considerations. If I gave you KR red infections and KB blue infections, and your goal was to simply place those KR plus KB infections down in a way to maximize the total number of eventual infections, how, how would a centralized party um, do that. Okay, that's the max social welfare. So there's no strategic considerization. It's just an optimization problem, a centralized optimization problem. So that's the numerator. The denominator is the payoff that two players get, the sum of the payoffs of two players at equilibrium, taken by, take, given by the worst Nash equilibrium for that quantity. Okay, so we're comparing social welfare, the sum of the infections for the two players, but in one case we're not treating them as players, and we're just solving a centralized optimization problem, and the denominator is what can their worst payoff be at equilibrium, okay? So this is a, just the special case of the well-known price of anarchy more generally, okay? The worst Nash equilibrium, you sort of look at the worst Nash equilibrium. Of the two, the sum of the, the welfare of the two players at Nash equilibrium, okay? Um, taken as the worst case overall Nash equilibrium. Okay, so you can think of this measure, and the reason it was introduced is it, it compares essentially the, the non-competitive maximum social welfare to what, what might happen to the players at Nash equilibrium, okay? So if this ratio is bounded or rather small, one says that the price of anarchy is small, and the interpretation being that the sort of societal or social welfare costs to competitive aspects of play are not that bad, right? If the price of anarchy is two, then even despite the equilibrium condition, the players are always getting at least half of the maximum social welfare. And if the price of anarchy is very, very large, it means that there are equilibria, bad equilibria in the sense that the sum of the payoffs to the two players is much, much worse than you could have get and gotten from sort of a socialist centralized planner, okay? Um, uh, now, in our particular model, notice that this quantity is mainly interesting in cases where you have only partial adoption at the end of the dynamics, right? If everybody is going to get infected in the entire network eventually, and it's just a matter of how long it takes, then basically, you know, wherever you put the adoptions really, as long as, let's say, the network is connected, you're eventually going to get everybody infected, and so the price of anarchy will be one, okay? So our upper bounds for this quantity are going to hold for any graph and our lower bounds are gonna hold for specific graphs and they're gonna depend on properties of F and G that I'll, I'll get to shortly. Okay, the price of budgets <coughs> is a new quantity that's sort of measured, it has a similar flavor to the price of anarchy but it's meant to capture a different thing which is how badly, if you think of the price of anarchy as measuring how much can the network and choices of F and G um, 
you know, make the players worse off compared to the max social welfare solution. Here, the price of budgets is going to measure how much the network and choices of F and G can warp the initial ratio, budget ratios, okay? So in the price of budget for a game is defined as follows. So let me talk about the denominator first. Remember, red has the larger budget. So in the denominator, we put the ratio of red's initial budget to blue's initial budget. So let's take a concrete example. Let's suppose red has three times as many initial infections as red. We put three in the denominator here. The numerator is the ratio of their eventual payoffs after the stochastic dynamics, okay? And we're going to take the maximum of this quantity over um, all these. This, of course, is an expectation. And we're going to take the max of this quantity over all Nash equilibrium. OK? So if, for instance, there's some Nash equilibrium in which the expected payoff, the ratio of the expected payoffs of the two players, red to blue, is 30, then we're going to say that the price of budgets is 10. Because the initial imbalances in budgets have been multiplied by a factor of 10 by the underlying dynamics. OK? The definition clear? Yeah. The strategies? The, the, the pure strategies are all possible sets of, of infections of size KR and KB, respectively. Okay. Okay. So those are the two quantities I'm going to study. And now let me just give a summary of um, what the main results are. So, by the way, I said this is a work in progress, and I think we, are, we have most of the pieces in place, but you'll see there are some question marks. But I think what we're essentially heading in this model, which in some ways is a justification of the decomposition that the model makes between F and G, is that what happens with the price of anarchy is largely characterized by properties of F and largely invariant to properties of G. And price of budgets is a little bit more complicated, but there are still sort of, you can, you can fill in very, very broad classes of behavior based on properties of F and G, okay? So let's, let's talk about the price of anarchy first. So let's first take this, the particular case where G, the selection function, is linear, okay? So if you're going to adopt, you select proportionally among your neighbors, okay? So then what one can prove is that as long as F is concave, any concave function, the price of anarchy is bounded by some small constant. I think it's eight right now. It might get better with, with more hacking. But the price of anarchy is bounded by some small constant, regardless of the graph. No matter what the graph structure looks like and no matter how large the graph is, you won't, you're, you're, the players will do well. They'll, they'll get some constant fraction of the max social welfare solution. In contrast, if F is convex, the opposite happens. So if you have a convex contagion function, then I can give you families of graph with essentially unbounded price of anarchy, okay? I can make the price of, but with a sufficiently large graph, I can make the price of anarchy as large as I want, okay? And what's interesting about this is that this holds true um, not for just some extremely convex function, but I can give you infinitesimally convex functions, things that are just barely below linear, and still you can get unbounded price of anarchy, okay? Um, and then we also have more specific bounds that depend on more detailed properties of F that, that I, I won't discuss. Um, this result holds regardless, actually, of the form of G. It holds for punishing G or equalizing G. It essentially holds for any G. So if F is convex, the price of anarchy is bad and invariant to your choice of G. And you see those two question marks, which are hinge on an irritating lemma that we've been struggling with, but, but it, I think we'll get there eventually. So I think our strong conjecture is that the way the picture will eventually look is that this result also is invariant to G, and that in that case, all that matters for the price of anarchy is the concavity or convexity of F, okay? To give, us, to give a, a corollary of these results, or application if you like, here for the specific case where G is linear and the, um, contagion function is this polynomial form that I gave before, f of x equals x to the r, um, we have the following. If r is less than or equal to 1, which is the concave case, then you have a bounded price of anarchy. And if r is even slightly larger than 1, infinitesimally larger than 1, then you have an unbounded. So you really have this threshold effect, right, where that as you move this parameter, um, basically you have nicely bounded price of anarchy for all values of r less than 1, and then as soon as you go even infinitesimally above 1, you have unbounded price of anarchy. Okay? The picture for price of budgets is a little bit more complicated and maybe a little bit more interesting. Um, 
but, but let me summarize it. So first of all, let's look at the bottom row. Basically, F still matters here, right? So um, this might be a little bit counterintuitive, but it turns out that if F is convex, you still can't get good bounds in the price of budgets. You can have unbounded, the, 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 in the ratios of the payoffs can be arbitrarily different from the initial ratios. Yes? Um, it, it means that, well, it doesn't depend on parameters of F and G in the sense summarized in this cell, right? Any con, for instance, any concave, you know, the, any, if, if, as long as F is concave, then any concave function will give you this. When I say constant, I basically mean um, both what you said, which is sort of independent of the actual values of KR and KB, because all that matters is their ratio. But also, mo most importantly, I mean it has no dependence on the size or structure of the network. It holds for arbitrarily large networks. Okay? <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So, so constant independent of KR and KB subject to, the, you know, subject to their ratio mattering, right? And independent of size of the network or structure of the network. Okay, so the, the upper, you know, like many things in computer science, the upper bounds here are very, very general, right? They're holding for rather rich classes of graphs. The lower bounds are going to show specific bad graphs where things go wrong if you, you know, in the sense of wanting these quantities to be bounded. Okay. Um, okay, so you need concave, to have any hope of bounded price of budgets, you still need F which doesn't really seem to have that much to do with the relative selection between the two parties, you still need that to be convex. If it's concave, well, if G is linear and we conjecture if it's equalizing, although we again have a, a lemma to prove here, um, but the conjecture, so you can prove that if G is linear and any, you have any concave F, then the price of budgets is bounded. We conjecture the same for G equalizing. Of course, if G is punishing, then you might suspect that you could get a warping of the initial ratios, and that is in fact true, right? You can, you can again get this result where even for slightly punishing selection functions, you can have arbitrarily large price of budgets, okay? And you can again kind of get a similar type of threshold result. So concretely, if we now let F, the selection function, be linear, and let the contagion function be in this Tulloch contest family, um, then you have the case that, for instance, when it's linear, then the price of budgets is bounded by some constant. And if it's even slightly um, punishing, so S1 plus epsilon, then you have unbounded, um, you have an unbounded uh, ratio. OK. Let me just quickly sketch some of the proof ideas. Um, so for the, for the upper bounds, both the, the, so these are basically where F is concave. And, and G, you know, depending for, for price of anarchy, and F is concave and G is equalizing or linear in the case of price of budget. Um, the main proof idea is, is what I would call coupled simulation. So let me just take a concrete case. Let's suppose we want to bound the price of anarchy under a concave F and a linear G. And let me use SR and SB to denote the initial, any initial set of infections of size KR and KB in the graph, sort of not dealing with the strategic considerations. Just give me any two initial sets of infections. So what I want to do is arrange a simulation um, of three different stochastic processes in parallel. Okay? So uh, in one of the stochastic processes, I want to simulate the dynamics of the underlying model when both SR and SB are present as the in initial sets of infections. In the second case, I want to take the red set and simulate it in isolation in the network with no blues at all. And in the third case, I want to simulate the blues alone with no reds at all. Okay? So obviously, for fixed SR and SB, these, I could do three separate independent simulations, but that's not what I want to do for the purposes of the proof. What I want to do is actually run a simulation in which at each step of the simulation, every vertex will be in a, a state consisting of a triple. The triple basically representing the, the state of that vertex in this first simulation when the two are run together, the second when it's the red only simulation, and the third is the blue only simulation. And I want to do a simulation that maintains these states, that basically balances two properties. I want it to be the case that the components are actually not independent. That's, that I could easily do, but it won't let me prove anything. 
Um, but that projecting onto any one of those components will actually give me a perfectly faithful simulation of that particular simulation. So if I look just at the joint simulation, I'll get a faithful draw from the joint, from the joint dynamics. If I look at one of the solos, I get that. Okay. So I, I, want, to, I want to maintain that. I want to, I want to maintain the, the faithfulness despite the correlations. But what I want to do is I want to maintain this invariant which is that any time there's an infection in the joint simulation, whether it's red or blue, there will either be a red infection in the red solo simulation or a blue infection in the blue solo simulation. Okay? So, that, this is, so why do I want to maintain this invariant? I'll come to that in a second. But, but how do I do it? Right? So the, 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 at a high level, the reason is this very simple picture, which is if I know that locally, if A and B are the fractions of, let's say, red and blue, if I know locally that F, F is concave, so F of A plus B is less than F of A plus F of B, well, let me just write these quantities down in this suggestive way. I'll first write a line segment of length F of A. I'll then write a line segment of length of B. And then below them, I'll write a line segment of length F of A plus B, which by definition is always smaller than the sum of these two. Okay? So now if I just choose a random number between 0 and 1, if, if it falls here, for instance, then there will be an infection in the red only simulation and in the red plus blue one. Okay? If it falls here, it will be only in the blue and the red plus blue one. But by sharing this randomization, I essentially ga I guarantee this invariant that any time there's an infection in this joint simulation, there will be an infection either in the red solo or the blue solo. Okay. Why is this a good thing? This is a good thing because it basically lets you say that the, you know, if you have two sets of infections, red and blue, then the total number of infections generated by them together is less than or equal to the sum of the solo infections in the two other simulations. And this allows you to apply equilibrium arguments that let you invade the max social welfare solution. So once this holds, right, if it were the case that together the two players were getting, you know, one one millionth of the max social welfare solution, well, we know that one of them could essentially defect and move on to some fraction of the max social welfare solution and get much more than they were getting before. Okay? And there's trickiness around these, la I'm waving my hands about these last part of the arguments, but it's really the simulation argument that lets you show that there's got to be a, a fair amount of the max social welfare in the equilibrium solution. Okay. Um, for the lower prime proof idea, rather than going through this sort of semi-math, let me show you a simulation. Um, these are all for mixed and, what was the question? Yeah, you Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> um, okay, so let me show you, let me show you a proof by picture of the lower bound. Uh, so in particular, um, Okay, so let's look at this choice of, let, let's consider the price of budgets now, just to change pace instead of the price of anarchy. I want to I wanna give you a proof by picture for why, even when the, select, even when the contagion, fun oh, sorry, I, want, I don't want this one. Let me give, uh, I want this one. Okay, so here we have um, a contagion function, which is essentially very contagious, right? With a little bit of adoption in your neighborhood, you're certain to adopt. So there's going to be a lot of infections. Um, and we have a slightly punishing selection function, right? The minority player, this, the minority player has slightly less than their share of chance of being adopted, okay? Um, and so I want to just show you a, a picture of why um, the, the player with the smaller initial budget um, can do very, very poorly at equilibrium. Okay. So this is a graph, which, which is a layered graph, in which at the initial layer, which was over here, red starts with six infections and blue starts with four infections. Okay? So initially the fraction, let's say, of blue here is, um, is uh, um, four out of ten, right? It's two-fifths. Okay? So what happens, so then we have this very much larger next layer and full connectivity between this layer and this layer. So what happens, right, is the player, blue player starts off with, um, with uh, four, I mean, sorry, with four-tenths, right, with two-fifths of the, 
it starts off with two-fifths of the infections, and the expected fraction it gets at the next time step is g of two-fifths, right? And because g is punishing, g of two-fifths is smaller than two-fifths. At the next layer, the player expects to get g of g of two-fifths, and at the next layer expects to get g of g of g of two-fifths, okay? And so you can see exactly that this is happening, right? The fraction, the successive fraction of infections that blue is getting is being diminished as this graph gets deeper because we're essentially amplifying, we're composing G with itself at every layer, okay? Now, of course, why would blue choose to play there given that this is happening to them? So part of the trickiness in making this argument work out, there's sort of two things you have to work out. One is you need to get the number of these layers and their sizes right because you essentially need to get concentration around expectations. You need sort of, you know, law, strong law of large number kinds of arguments. And you have to work out how deep the network needs to be to get to any um, given desired lower bound on the price of budgets. And then the other thing you need to do is to somehow arrange it so that this is actually an equilibrium, that blue wants to play where you're playing. And, and I won't go into details of those, that, but that's kind of what, you, what one needs to address. Okay, um, future work. Uh, so I think in the near term, the thing we want to most do is to fill in the question marks uh, on the tables I showed you summarizing our results. And I already indicated to you what our strong belief about what happens in those different entries is, um, but we need to, to get the proofs nailed down. And once we do that, I think we'll have a, a complete characterization, if you like, of what happens in this broad class of models that really just depends on properties um, simple underlying properties like convexity or concavity of the selection function, I mean of the contagion function, and punishing or equalizing properties of the selection function. Um, of course, we want to get back to this much messier question of how network structure and equilibrium properties are related, even for special families of network structures. Um, I think there are interesting, I'm a computer scientist by training, and I think there are interesting computational questions such as um, is this taxonomy um, by concavity, convexity properties of F and punishing equalizing properties of G also a useful way of classifying the computational difficulty of various problems in this model, such as how hard is it to compute best responses to a fixed set of plays of your neighbor? Um, and then another obvious generalization is to, instead of forcing the players to kind of look at the network before the dynamics are run at all and pick their infections, to allow them to spread their budget over time, watch how infections are evolving, and gradually dole out their budget of infections as the network starts to um, you know, engage in adoption. Okay? And um, there's, of course, a lot of interesting related work, some of it very old, some of it very recent. Um, and I'll just leave this last slide up and, and take a question if there's time. Okay, we, have, we have time for questions. Do you, do you want to repeat the question? That, that's what we uh, uh, sure. You can have the mic. Yeah, I'll, I'll repeat. Yes, so, so this is, so I'm defining Nash equilibrium in the entirely standard way. This is a normal form game. In, this is a normal form game in which the pure strategies are the sets of infections that the two players can choose. Once they choose those, those are the inputs to a simulation which draws a random variable, which is their final number of infections each. Um, okay, so I didn't address how we break ties. In the case that we had, if in, in the model that I'm discussing, I, and I think my, the results are largely invariant, but basically um, the assumption we're making right now is that if we both infect the same no, we have a 50-50 probability of getting the initial adoption by that <laughs> vertex. So we're breaking ties randomly. Um, so you're talking about for upper bounds, or? Uh, so actually, you mean, you mean in order, do I need the network to be large for the upper bounds in order to get? If they don't say that they're independent of network size, they must be large enough. No, so actually they don't, because if you think about this simulation argument I gave, what's nice about it is it's, it's enforcing this um, invariant that when there's a joint infection, then there must be at least one solo infection. It's enforcing that on an update-by-update -update basis. 
So the, the, ver you know, the very first update will obey this invariant, and you're going to obey it at every step afterwards. So you don't, the network could be of size 3, and this would hold. Um, okay, good, good, good. So, so you're, you're, you're talking about what I would call the update schedule, which is how do I actually go around and select which vertex to update. And there's at least two reasonable alternatives here. One is what I would call sequential, which is pick an uninfected guy to update and update him and then go on to the next one. Um, and the other is uh, which I, I would call kind of parallel updates where at each round you grab all of the uninfected vertices and you update them simultaneously in, re in response to the frozen state the, the, at the last up, after the last update. And by the way, I think each of these you know, are equally reasonable. You can think of some types of adoption where um, you, know, you, you might want to do it sequentially because some people just won't be paying as much attention and sort of don't get around to being updated until later. Other cases where you, know, you don't have a choice. Once you're exposed to a disease, you know, you're going to adopt right then, right? Um, or, or, or not, um, but you're basically uh, you know, influenced. So I think the summary statement is that our upper bounds are essentially invariant to these choices. And in, the, in our current state of knowledge, some of the lower bound constructions um, are easier. I think they'll all work out for both, but some of them are much easier in this simultaneous update model. So like in the, if you look at this layered construction that I gave, right, I showed it to you with simultaneous adoption, which is why when layer two, boom, layer three, boom, layer four, boom. If you had sequential updates, things might happen out of order. Somebody might get infected in layer three before somebody in layer two, and that could screw up this argument that essentially you're, you're composing G with itself at every step. But I don't think that, I think these are technical difficulties, not, not truths. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I mentioned that for, you know, I think an interesting avenue for further work are, is this case where you can dynamically dole your budget out over time. If I had to make a, I'm kind of going out on a limb here, but if I had to make a guess, I, again, the upper bounds are extremely powerful because they're based on these update by update invariance arguments in this coupled simulation. And so I think that they might survive even with dynamic policies, um, but uh, I have to, have to think about it. That's right. I think an obvious extension would be to look at the entire paths and say, you know, you don't care so much about the ones in the future. You might get a lot of adoption early on. You might value that more than having lots afterwards. So I'm not sure what you're suggesting. I mean, so it, that normal standard people discount the future. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think, yeah. So I, I think there are other um, payoffs that are interesting. So that's one. I think another one which is not the same as the one we have here, is that you don't care about how many adoptions you get. You just care about market share. So it's fine with me if I, you know, I'm happy, I'm equally happy with 90% market share in a small market as I am in a large market, right? And, and there are cases, especially in technology, right, where people care more about that early on um, because they, be, presumably because they're going to eventually care about the, the, the total number, but they want to just basically get rid of their competitors at some early stage. So I think these are all reasonable extensions that, that we might get around to addressing at some point. Okay, okay. thank you.